The bell has rung, the GB News Tavern is open, and I'm joined tonight by Samart Lal Grant, former senior diplomat and national security advisor. Samart, welcome. Thank you. To Talking Pints and GB News. Good evening. Now, you joined the diplomatic service many years ago. How, do, how does that happen? How does one do this? Well, it happened a little bit by accident for me, to be honest, because I did law at university and I qualified as a barrister mm -hmm. and I was called to the bar. And at the same time, just for the fun of it, because I was one of these sort of guys who likes taking exams, I took the Foreign Office uh, exams. I'd thought of doing that at university, but I broke my hand just before and couldn't do them. So when I was in London doing the bar exams, I thought I'd take the Foreign Office exams. And I think because I wasn't really ever intending to join the Foreign Office, I managed to get through the exams and the process and was offered a job. And they were offering me the princely sum of £5,000 a year. Because I'm just thinking, if you've just been called to the bar, you could have made quite a lot more money if you, if you stayed in Certainly the Certainly would have made a lot more money, but not initially. And I was, I'd done a postgraduate course in, in Brussels in EU law. And uh, so I was 24. I was still dependent on my parents. And uh, the Foreign Office was offering sort of instant independence. Yeah. Rather than at the bar in those days, you weren't paid for the first sort of couple of right. years. Yeah. Although, of course, in the end, you would have earned a lot more money. Yeah. Yeah, so the Foreign Office it was, and, and I guess, you know, I mean, because I worked in Brussels for years and I've interacted with the Foreign Office, it's not always been that, well, it's always been civil. <laughs> we may not have agreed on much, but it's always, yeah, it has always been civil, actually, as it should be. But one looks at the Foreign Office, it's a very elitist organisation, isn't it? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it was at one point, and certainly in my intake, the sort of uh, graduate intake was all white and it was all male. But that has changed very significantly. And now, I think ten, the 10 most senior ambassadorial posts overseas are held by women. Right. And there's a lot of uh, senior officers from ethnic minorities as well. So, no, it's a very much more diverse organisation than it was when I joined 40 years ago. And to get into the Foreign Office, you've got to pass that exam still. It's an open exam, and uh, everyone can apply. Yep. Uh, it's an online exam at the first stage, and they whittle that down from, say, 60,000 down to sort of a couple of thousand, and then there's various exercises and interviews and things like that. So it's rigorous, but it is completely open, and anyone can apply. Fair enough, and you've worked... have to be a British national. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you've worked all over the world, postings in Pakistan and goodness knows where else. Um, so you obviously care deeply about all those places that you've been to. You also served at the United Nations. Um, I'm guessing that the last, the last few years must have been quite a trauma for you, really, because the course that was set in terms of our membership of the evolving European Union, uh, the belief in quite big globalist structures... Um, it's been fractured in quite a big way, hasn't it, by the Brexit vote, by, you know, a much bigger debate. And I'm thinking that perhaps one of the impacts from the Russian invasion of Ukraine is we genuinely will start thinking more about energy independence, for argument's sake, a point that I was just debating earlier in yeah. the show. Uh, we'll rely far less on global just-in-time supply chains. There's going to be a change of thinking towards much more of a national perspective. Yes. And, and, and that is a challenge for a foreign office that's been set on a particular route for decades. Well, you're right uh, in one way that I joined in 1980 and there's been three seminal events really since then. The Falklands War was absolutely seminal mm. in allowing Margaret Thatcher to have the time to turn around the British economy and it fundamentally changed most diplomats' career from potentially managing decline, as everyone talked about yeah. in the 1970s, yeah. to suddenly representing a country that meant something and had a lot of influence. Then you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, obviously absolutely critical. Yeah. And the third one was, certainly for the United Kingdom, was Brexit. Mm. Uh, and that has changed a great deal. But interestingly, although personally I think it's a strategic mistake, mainly for economic reasons, that's my personal view... I have always said, and I've said this publicly, and I said it at the time, that in terms of Britain's influence in the world or its national security, there is no reason why Brexit per se should damage either of those two things. And I can explain why, if you like. But... Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about that because I'm quite struck, and I'll sort of throw this back at you for a second, I'm quite struck that in terms of foreign policy, over the course of the last decade, well, 15 years probably, 
we were getting closer and closer to a European position. It was a European position on Zimbabwe. It was a European position on Putin and Russia. You know, we weren't speaking independently as a country. And I, I can only, please disagree with me, but I kind of feel that the AUKUS deal with Australia, actually the Ukraine, where, and whatever one thinks of Boris Johnson's leadership on, on other aspects of, of, of domestic life, but actually, when it comes to the Ukrainian issue, and whether they, whether they got it right or wrong is irrelevant, in the sense that they actually were quite decisive, quite out there, uh, giving leadership. And in a sense, it was America. I felt it was America and the European Union following the lead that we were giving. So doesn't this kind of show... You, you did say that your principal reason for wishing to stay was economic. Yeah. Uh, and, and we could debate that forever, but we're, we're just not going to. Um, but, but actually, aren't we already beginning to gain a bit more self-confidence on the world stage with Brexit in terms of foreign policy? I think it's a bit early to come to that conclusion, but certainly, and I was in New York as ambassador to the UN at mm. the time of the Scottish referendum, there's no doubt in my mind that Scottish independence would be much more damaging both to our security and to our international standing than Brexit uh, ever could be. I mean, you're right to some extent, I think, to say that we have greater autonomy now, we have more opportunity to set out our own position. But what we've lost is the ability to influence the EU positions. Because without us... They never listened the EU, to us, did Oh, they? well, you would be surprised how much influence we had, particularly in the foreign and security area, because we were the biggest defence spenders in Europe. We had a huge clout as alongside the French. And we had huge clout on things like competition and open trade alongside the northern uh, Europeans. So without us... The risk is that the European Union will shift its position. We won't necessarily shift our position. Some people say we'll get closer to the Americans. I don't think we will. I think our position is our position. But the Europeans will move further away from the Americans without us. Yes. And that is why the Dutch and the Swedes and the Poles are so upset uh, at us leaving. Do you think the EU will be there in 10 years' time? I think it will. I think there's a huge political impetus behind it. Uh, oh, it I know that. Fundamentally a <laughs> it is fundamentally Having a political <laughs> process. <laughs> and the political will between France and Germany in particular, because of the history, uh, is so strong that it will survive. Uh, I'm absolutely sure. Well, we'll see. I'm sure it'll be, if it does survive, it's going to have to adapt and change. Now, after your stint um, over on second in Manhattan... National Security Advisor. I'm in a heck of a job yeah. to take on and amazing, an amazing job to have. And yet, your time there was a time when we began to see a rise of extremist Islamic terrorism. Yep. Uh, we began to see, I think, actually, for the first time in many, many years, some genuine fear. You know, do we get the tube train or in London or don't? I mean, that sort of thing was happening. And yet... And I was, you know, sort of count our chickens, but there have in the last couple of years, few years, been surprisingly few of these attacks. Is that evidence that our intelligence services are on top of this? I mean, they can never be totally on top of it, I get. But are we kind of on top of this? I wouldn't come to that conclusion exactly. I think what is evident is that we went through a period of very extreme terrorist attacks, Islamist mainly terrorist attacks, mm -hmm. um, and also rising cyber attacks. And what is interesting about those two threats, as opposed to, say, the threat from Russia or the threat from China, mm -hmm. is that the government cannot really 100% keep its people safe. It can do a lot, and the government has done a lot, and we did a lot when I was there in terms of reinforcing the intelligence services, better coordination between law enforcement and intelligence, uh, setting up the National Cyber Security Centre, the yep. first time to help business. So there's a lot the government can do, but the reality is that if an individual takes a knife, goes out in the street, starts stabbing people, off the radar, as it were, there is very little the government can do to do it. And that's why I think there, there was a time when the sense of personal insecurity went up in this country despite the fact, in a strategic mm. sense, the country has never been safer. And yet, I think people got more upset with those that committed terrible atrocities, London Bridge being one example, where some of these people were known already to the authorities. And that led to a feeling, well, well hang on, if we know about these people, why aren't we doing more? Well, because we know about a lot of people. 
and you can't put everyone under 24-hour surveillance, can't which is extremely resource-intensive. Therefore, you have to make choices the whole time. And MI5 mm. are making choices the whole time about where are the priority threats. Most of the time, they get it absolutely right. And as you rightly say, there have been very few terrorist attacks, deadly terrorist attacks mm. in the UK mercifully. in recent yeah. years, mercifully. And something like 30 really quite developed terrorist attacks have been thwarted in the last four years. And that is a sign that... Mm. You can never say you're on top of it because it's a continuing threat and it won't go away in our generation, that, that is for certain. But nonetheless, I think the government has the right approach to it. 650 people have crossed the English Channel in dinghies in the last two days. Haven't got the numbers yet. It'll be 90% young men. They'll be between 16 and 28. Uh, none of them will have a passport. We won't have a clue where any of them come from. We won't know whether they uh, genuinely are fleeing something awful or whether they were fighting for ISIS. Uh, two or three years back. Um, how concerned should we be about that? The numbers are still relatively small, and we mustn't lose sight of that perspective. Well, have a look at this. The this, vast... this is today's, Sir Mark, and, and, you know, yeah. we but now the... learn that the figure for last year has been revised upwards, the nearly yeah. 30,000. Yeah. Estimates this year it could be 60,000. Yeah. It's quite a lot of people. It's quite a lot of people, but, look, there's been a million in Germany. There's yeah. hundreds of thousands in France and in Spain and in Italy. So we are relatively well protected because of our geographical position from these inflows of uh, illegal uh, migrants. It doesn't feel like it. I, it may not feel like it uh, to some people, but the reality is um, that we need a lot of immigration, legal immigration. This illegal immigration needs to be stopped. But the real problem is where is it stopped? And in my view, the French government have not always done as much as they should do. Because those who are fleeing from France to the UK cannot claim that they're coming from an unsafe environment to a safe one because they're perfectly safe. And that in principle. France, they that... want to come. And that principle of the first yeah. uh, country yes. of uh, yes. refuge is being breached all over the place. And you can understand why, because southern European countries are saying, well, just by accident of geography, we are getting the vast majority, mm. and you in Britain or, or Netherlands, say, or Sweden, are not getting as many, and you should share the burden. And this was a great uh, problem for us when we were in the European Union. We opted out from the Schengen Agreement precisely so that we could keep yeah. some control of it. Yeah. But it's caused huge problems in the rest of the EU with people arguing about I who know, should take what. And, of course, the migrants want to go maybe to Germany, because that's a place where you can get a well-paid job, or they might want to come to the UK because they've got relatives or friends in the UK. Well, I think it's called the benefit system, isn't it? And I think our benefit system is very much more generous than they're going to get in any other European country. Um, and, all the while, <laughs> and also, uh, you know, the fact that we don't really deport anybody anymore. There are lots of reasons why. I just wonder, sort of finally thinking the really big picture of what's going on, was NATO expansion, continual NATO expansion to the east, was it a mistake? No, I don't think it was a mistake. I mean, one forgets the trauma that many of these countries went through mm. before 1989. Suddenly the Berlin Wall fell down. They had the opportunity to join uh, institutions that they wanted to join, and many wanted to join NATO. Most of them, in fact. No, I, and the, the European way, the way, Union. I get that. I get that. And NATO is a completely defensive alliance. And when President Putin claims that he feels threatened by NATO, this is rubbish. This invasion of Ukraine is all about protecting the Putin rule, mm. the Putin regime. Mm. And as part of what he considers, to coin a phrase, if excuse the phrase, to make Russia great again. That's what he wants. He wants to put back the old Russian empire. No, because he does. It's no, nothing I, to do with no, security. Of course he does. I mean, I mean, look, I, you know, seven or eight years ago, I was saying in the European Parliament, I thought we would, prov we would provoke him into war. It doesn't justify in any way what he's done. How does this end, do you think? How do you sort of, looking into the crystal ball, at least there are some negotiations going on, the Russian military having a tougher time. What's the way out of this? Well, Putin is going to lose, undoubtedly. But unfortunately, that does not mean that Ukraine will win. I mean, Ukraine has lost massively already. You know, yeah. Tens of thousands of civilians killed, uh, cities destroyed, yeah, millions of refugees. It's horrendous. But I think President Zelensky has been quite sensible and statesmanlike in what he said um, in the last couple of days, that all conflicts end in some form of agreement. Mm. And he's right about that. And therefore, these talks are a way out. Quite what the terms of that agreement will be and how long this conflict will last is virtually impossible no, to predict at this stage. It is.